there's something about the swan because it's so large and so pure, brilliant white. It almost by existing in that kind of beautiful, brilliant luminescence almost immediately always implies its opposite. Welcome to Soar Mystica, a podcast exploring life's mysteries and magic through its symbols. I'm Mariana Lewis, an archetypal tarotist. And I'm astrologer Christina Farella. And just as the Soror Mystica guided the alchemist through his holy work, we hope to be your mystic sisters in these conversations, guiding you deeper into the symbolic life. Hey everybody, welcome to the 17th episode of Soror Mystica. Today, we are talking all about the symbol of the swan. And as uh, the summer progresses, Christina and I have been looking at how the podcast is doing, and we are extremely thrilled that there is a lot of you out there listening. We've gotten so much good feedback. So if you haven't given us your feedback yet, we'd really appreciate you leaving us a review either on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you do your thing. Um, it's it's really just been astonishing that people actually like us rambling about the things that we <laughs> were obsessed with. I never really would have imagined that people would have enjoyed it. I really thought that people would listen to one episode and be like, these people are annoying and and shut it off. But that's not, no not happened thus far, at least not not for all we're the charming. Listeners. We're charming. I like that perspective. Um, I think that we like to talk about the things we like to talk about and thank God there's other people who like to talk about them too. (laughs) Uh, Um, all right, so let's jump into it. Why don't you tell me, uh, as always what you're reading? Hello everyone. Hello, Mariana. This week I am reading many various texts on Greek myth and hymn because Mm. I'm in the middle of teaching my mythology for astrologers class which is really, really fun and definitely a treat. So each week I've been providing people with um, just like PDFs basically of reading material from Ovid or from the Homeric hymns. Um, And so I just keep immersing myself in that world. And it's really lovely to be there and um, be thinking about the gods in that particular way. So not too, not anything too specific, but just like a smattering of books that I keep tripping over or knocking down as I keep building piles in my office, which is fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, what are you reading? I am reading, I just started, well, I finished Babel by um, R.F. Kuang, I believe is how you pronounce her name. Um, and I just started a new novel, which I found out was from the 80s called uh the name of the rose mm. by i want to say it's um, echo echo yeah. yeah umberto echo i don't know how I. that's found like a perfect it. book for you isn't it yeah. i didn't know anything about this until i was just googling good books medieval S- scary yeah. i don't know what i was looking for and it popped up apparently it was like a movie with uh sean connery at some point too um in the 80s and it's basically a murder mystery set in a monastery in 14th century i think northern italy so i mean how could it be more perfect for me but it's, it's really 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 long <laughs> yes yep so yeah mm-hmm. i'm only like 50 pages in but so far it's extremely self-indulgent with all its medievalisms which um, according to the reviews, is very annoying, but not to me. I love it. I want more medievalisms, please. I've read like half of that book years ago, and um, I know that that um, recently Mike asked me if you had read it. Oh like, yeah, really? Like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that's I love to hear that you are enjoying that because that's just very on brand. So yeah, that's great. That's really cool. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it was because I, I have this the um, thrift books. Mm-hmm. thing. I told you about this. If people don't know about thrift books, highly recommend thrift books. It's just an online used bookstore. Um, and the, it has like some program where you recommend, you know, to somebody, Hey, buy a book through thrift books. And if they do, if they buy a book that's over $20, then you get a free book that's under like six bucks or something. And, and they get a free book. And so I don't know, on some video or something one time I was like, recommended a book and was like, hey, and you should buy it on thrift books because this is cool. And then for like three straight days, 
I earned like 30 free books. And so I <laughs> don't know what happened. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Probably the YouTube algorithm like threw my video at a lot of people very quickly. And I don't know, maybe a lot of people bought the book I read. I really have no idea. It may have been like a system error, but I have many, many free books. So <laughs> I keep trying, but I have to buy one in order to get the free one. So this is the scam. And I have stacked my library and I have another one coming today. I'm very excited. I don't I'm remember what it you. is. Yeah. This is the great. only way to live life is just to be building endless piles of books that will one day collapse on us and kill us. And yeah. that is how we will die. Mm-hmm. I'm, I mean, it's not the worst way to die. I'll take it. Um, all right. Shall we talk about the swan, the beautiful yeah. swan? Mm-hmm. I'm sure you have symbols for us as you always do the book of symbols to tell us about the swan. I do. Yes. So we can start there and then we'll kind of expand into what the swan might mean. Um, And so sometimes for those of you who have been following along with us, I will read from a book that gives me a kind of bouquet of symbolic ideas and it's just called the illustrated cyclopedia encyclopedia of traditional symbols um and so the entry for the swan is actually pretty long um so i'll kind of skim it but um it says the swan combines the two elements of air and water the swan is the bird of life the dawn of day and solar it also signifies solitude and retreat and is the bird of the poet Its dying song is the poet's song. Its whiteness is sincerity. The swan and goose are often symbolically interchangeable. And so this list of places where the swan shows up in mythology kind of goes out from here, but there are affiliations with um, the duality of light and day, day and night. Um, And there are qualities of the god Apollo and Aphrodite And there's even something about death and lamentation in the swan. So we have a lot of really interesting territory to expand into. And one of the things that I really enjoy most on this um, kind of continued conversation is when we get to touch in with nature oriented imagery, it just really piques my like earth sign Mm -hmm. preferences and sensibilities. And I enjoy thinking about the ways that these, um, creatures are just, you know, naturally occurring, naturally existing, and yet have so much poetic power behind them or mythic symbolic power behind them. I find that to be totally fascinating. So I'm excited to talk about a creature uh, today Mm -hmm. in this this show. It's our first creature. We were Mm -hmm. um, discussing that on our, our mini vacay together. (laughs) <laughs> which we got to do, which was a delight because you live on the other side of the world, which is terrible. Um, but we got we got a day or two at the beach. Um, yeah, we sat by the be, ocean yeah. and complained bitterly for five hours straight <laughs> and read. <laughs> we did, well, we pretended to read. Oh, no, we held our books. We, we, we held now. our books. <laughs> we held our books for like three hours and we're like, <laughs> are you going to read? Because we can keep gossiping. And then we, we were just, just kept chatting. gossiping. Mm-hmm. And we uh, ate leftover pizza. And we saw someone catch a shark, we and it was did. terrible. That was horrifying. I was not about – and then I almost burned the, all the skin off my foot. That mm-hmm. was the only place I got burned because I always do that. I always just burn one random part of my body and nothing else. So, But it was a great day, um, and we were like, we've never done animals. And so I'm really glad that we're doing the swan starting with it because we both got fed the same um, Instagram reel. Mm -hmm. which made us think about swans, Mm -hmm. which is also very cute. Um, And it was that reel where there's two swans and one of them had had an injured wing or something like that. And they returned it to the lake and they, they're like life partners. And these two swans are swimming to each other, doing this gorgeous dance of just like moving their heads back and forth and like chattering their beaks at each other. And it was, it was very moving. And then we're both like, let's do swans. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that the um, symbols book offers so many things to, to explore with the swan. I love that it brings in the idea of lamentation, the swan song um, and the, the solar energy, the masculine energy to the swan. A lot of people think of swans having a feminine energy because they're beautiful, but actually there's a, a lot of uh, uh, masculine kind of attachments to the swan. Yeah. And I think that the the swan, for most of us, initially, we think of beauty and we think of grace. We think of this, they have these beautiful long necks 
Um, and they have this way of gliding on the water. I have, um, I, I make most of my vacations to Europe because I'm obviously obsessed with medieval culture. Um, and I always try to see these medieval cities and they always have swans like swimming in the rivers and their lakes. They're always, they, they, they probably make sure there's always a family of swans there because it, it just makes the whole thing so idyllic. Um, and so I think that that's, that's the initial thought we have when we think about swans is that they, they really invite us into this soothing kind of beautiful, um, image that is is really just so sweet. There's something about being a little girl too, where like swans are fed to you as a kind of like, mm-hmm. I feel like once you get into like fairies and ballet, swans come up and then it's like part of the, like the landscape with um, mm-hmm. other mythical creatures like unicorns or mermaids or something. Swans are always figuring into this magical like menagerie for whatever reason. And yeah. I do think it is because of their their sort of grace and their slowness and the way that they hold themselves is extremely elegant. Um, but like you said, the swan actually has this really intense masculinity attached mm-hmm. to it. And so the first thing that, that – comes to mind when I think about what like swans and mythology is the myth of Leda and -hmm. the swan who is Zeus. So I guess I'll tell that story quickly just to kind of open us up. Um, And so basically, I mean, it's just one of these stories where Zeus decides that he is um, in need of conquesting (laughs) on someone. (laughs) That's what I say it. And needs to also disguise himself from Hera, his wife, who's very jealous and vengeful, and that is not her fault. Um, and so he, you know, catches a glimpse of Leda, who's this beautiful woman, and he transfigures himself into a swan and, like, whatever, they lay together. <laughs> um, it's so awful. And so so they, they get together. together. <laughs> and from that union... Um, from that union, you know, and, and when you read this story in myth, there is this interesting seduction of like the feathers and the wings of the swan and the woman. And it's, it's very, um, they're trying to make it seem very poetic and beautiful. And what is the result of this union though, is the birth of two sets of twins from an egg because mm-hmm. Zeus took the form of um, a bird when he was coupling with Leda. And the two sets of twins are the Dioscori, Castor, and Pollux, who we know as the Gemini twins, and Helen and Clytemnestra, who go on to be extremely famous in mythology in their own right. Helen, like Helen of the Trojan War fame, the war was fought for her beauty. And then Clytemnestra, the ill-fated mother of Iphigenia who winds up mm. in a really tragic family uh, family tree explosion because of the events that happen during the Trojan War. And so yeah. there is this interesting sort of suggestion of duality and doubling in the product of the swan, um, you know, the byproduct of that union. And so uh, the interplay between divine and mortal or light and dark, even masculine and feminine. There's a set of male twins and a set of feminine twins. So there is um, a lot that seems really strangely packed in there. But Zeus was the god of gods. He was yeah. the one in charge of Mount Olympus. And so thinking about his impact as the swan um, really makes us remember that the swan in this story is not this graceful, gentle creature, but a very greedy, patriarchal, forceful, all-consuming guy. Um, and yeah. so there's something in in that complexity, I think, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I know that swans are like the actual personality of swans is is said to be very aggressive they're mean have you ever yeah. been chased by a swan i've not been chased by oh, swan. okay you must have tried to feed swan. ducks <laughs> in your spare time <laughs> <laughs> i've i've seen some some swans snapping at at other birds but i've never i've they're never myself been chased by one <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well i think that the idea of the doubling is so 
fascinating because we we do have um, this white swan, black swan duality that we see a lot. We have um, just just the image itself. The the black swan is an actual you know bird that's out there, um, and we have you know the movie Black Swan, of course, which is so ridiculously Jungian um, <laughs> and <laughs> um, very, very fascinating. Cause I mean, no spoilers, but there's, there's two sides of, of the, you know, there's the, uh, I forget her name, but the main character is in Swan Lake and she's, she's p- portraying the Swan. And so she is the epitome of grace and beauty. And then at the same time, there's this really, really dark energy. And there's this, this like alternate kind of version of, of the Swan that is black and, and shadowy. Um, and so we see that in, in that movie. And of course we know that that is a representation in some way of the shadow, the ego and the shadow um, and it makes me think also of Hilmoff Clint's um, image, uh, her painting of the the swan, which is so gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Um, their their necks like connect, right? Like their beaks. Touch I think or that their like beaks that. touch, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but they kind of it's so pretty how they move into each other, and there, there's this um, you know, opposition between the the light and the dark. Um, and so I, I totally agree with you. There is something about this. The black swan is also beautiful though. You know, it doesn't lose its beauty because it's, it has this darkness about it. Um, I, I've told you before, I, when I was in, um, undergrad, I was a vocal major. I was a classical singer person. Um, and one of the, uh, arias I was assigned was by Minotti from his, um, opera, The Medium. And it's called Black Swan. And it's it's so dark. And I highly recommend people go listen to it. It is a beautiful aria. Um, and it's basically a woman. And the, the just the lyrics are stunning. It's like, you know, the sun has fallen and it lies in blood. And the moon is weaving bandages of gold. And the imagery is just so lush and, and exquisite. But there's this feeling of darkness and sorrow and lamentation all throughout it um, without losing the beauty that the swan represents. And so I find that just gorgeous and and very um, captivating, that energy of of that dark swan in juxtaposition with with the light swan and the beauty they Mm -hmm. both hold. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that I mean, yeah, I recently saw Black Swan for the first time. I don't oh, know really? why I, I didn't see it before, but yeah, recently caught up with that. That was crazy bananas Horrifying. film. Yeah. <laughs> and you know me and scary movies, but I could say I can handle that. I can handle it. Well, that's more psychological. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's Everyone not... listening, I don't like scary movies. Don't ever make me watch one, please. <laughs> I won't do it. Stefan wants me to, my husband wants me to, um, to have Christina watch Hereditary. So if anybody out there not. has watched Hereditary. I will not be doing that. You all can do that by yourself. It's really good. It's extremely, extremely I believe good. in Ari Aster as a filmmaker, but I do not need to see Hereditary because I know things that happen. And I saw Midsummer, and you all can settle down. And that's my, that's my limit. <laughs> Midsummer was great. I love that one. Yeah. That one was not nearly to the level that Hereditary is. It's no, great. No, great no. film. It's crazy. <laughs> Anyway, um, I think that the duality, uh, there's something about the swan because it's so large and so pure, Mm -hmm. brilliant white. It almost by existing in that kind of beautiful, brilliant luminescence almost immediately always implies its opposite. It's one of those things Mm, that's like, this is so much what it is. This is so solar. This is so bright and dazzling that we almost always immediately reach for the opposite thing, at least I think in our symbolic imagination. And so, you know, Hilma painting the white swan and the black swan, but having their noses or their beaks touch implies this continuum between the, the binary of dark and light. And I think that that's why the swan is so compelling because it does have this almost just like, um, you know, untouchable purity that's associated with it. But then what there's, we know from 
Jungian thought from mythology that everything always contains its opposite or traces of its opposite. So I think that that's something that's really fascinating um, Mm -hmm. in that. mm -hmm, that Yeah. I love how you said that. It's so, it's so beautiful. It's, it kind of points to this idea in Jungian psychology of the compensating um, kind of element function in which when we are too one-sided, then we will naturally gravitate, gravitate towards the opposite. And so having that, like thinking of it as like when something is, is really in itself that it contains its opposite is kind of, you know, I, I bring this up in, in the tarot a lot. It's kind of like, especially when I see it reversed cards, it's almost like, have we, have we fallen so much into one side of things that now we're compensating for it with something else? Um, so I, I, I really, I really like that idea of this one. You're right. There is something about it that is like pristine, um, it's almost too beautiful. It's mm-hmm. like, it's really hard to think of an animal that, that has more of this quality of, of perfect beauty than, than the swan. We literally think of it whenever we're doing, um, some kind of romantic thing on the lake. Like, have you ever gone to Central Park and done the rowboats? No, because I'm from the kind of New York family that never did anything that was like <laughs> fun and touristy. Never been to the Statue of Liberty. Oh, no, me neither. Never did the Circle Line. Anyway. Well, I did yes. go to Statue of Liberty for a field trip. Mm-hmm. Um, I did in, in college. Yeah. <laughs> because we we were part of CUNY, which if people don't know what CUNY is, it's the City University of New York. And they're like, you have to be a true New Yorker, which means step one, going to Statue of Liberty because none of you have. <laughs> we're like, That's you so funny. are true. You're all right. <laughs> none of us have. Um, so that was fine. But uh, no, um, my my husband took me on a date, one of our first dates actually, when I was like 18 or That's something That's very cute like that. of him. It was, I think it was our first anniversary, like our first dating anniversary. It was very cute of him. I yelled at him a lot in advance that he had to do something very nice because <laughs> he's a Taurus. <laughs> so they need reminding. Um, and so he took me there. And it was just like this, it was, it, it was totally idyllic and, and gorgeous. And they have like swans swimming around. I'm like, what, where am I? <laughs> yeah. This is not New York City. It's, it's crazy because it just feels like you're in a romantic like movie like you're mm-hmm. just in a rom-com and there's swans mm-hmm. everywhere and so there's an element too with the swan of being like attached to this this you know uh romance that is just kind of really exaggerated mm. to the point where it's it just doesn't kind of loses a sense of reality which is why i think it's so fascinating that in older mythology this is kind of our contemporary connection to the the swan as a symbol and in older mythology, um, in the older mind, Swan had a much more serious kind of element to it. And as you said, there's this, the the lamentation um, part of the Swan, which we haven't really touched on that much yet. But there's this, this part of the Swan that speaks to, you know, with the idea of the Swan song, this finality of things. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a lovely transition into this idea. So, you know, we've kind of been opening up the the purity, the beauty of the swan, the um, the kind of solar qualities of the swan. The swan was also um, a kind of emblem of Apollo, the god of mm-hmm. the sun. The swan is also traditionally associated with Aphrodite, who is the goddess of love. Yeah. Um, and so there are all of these high romantic kind of associations with swans, but at the same time, again, leaning into the duality of life and death, the swan um, was thought to be a kind of herald of death, which is really Mm. interesting to the ancient Greeks. The swan was thought to either, there was two ideas here. The swan could sing its most beautiful song right before it passed away. And so if one heard a swan singing, it might mean that it was dying. And that's where we get the idea of the swan Mm, song from. That's where, yeah, it's really cool. Or if one heard a swan singing beautifully, it might be that someone else is dying. And swans Mm -hmm. were thought to kind of lament and open the channel for the soul to pass through. And so that's something that we could obviously do a whole episode on the role of um, lamentation in the ancient imagination, but that is a powerful tool. 
And it suggests that number one, the swan as oriented to beauty and solar qualities as it is also has a trace of Hades in it, which is interesting. And then also um, kind of like containing its opposite and being able to act as a kind of psychopomp or, or a guide for a soul to escort it out of the day world and into the afterlife or to note the transition, I think is really, really interesting. So um, yeah, I have a lot, a lot of curiosity about lamentation in general. And so when I found that the swan had that role, I was totally, totally blown away and excited, but it makes sense with the black swan, white swan story, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wonder where, where, um, black swans are from. I feel like I Googled them at some point and they're from Australia. Oh, wow natively um i don't know i may have made that up (laughs) we can verify that (laughs) we can probably verify that at some point um but yeah i i i I think that's also so gorgeous how you know lamentation you know you've you've done a lot of studies on on lamentation in the ancient world specifically in ancient greece i remember when i first met you, you were writing a paper for, I don't remember what class it was, but you were writing a paper on that. And it was, I was very smitten very quickly (laughs) because my Scorpio self was like, she's writing a paper on death. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, But yeah, so I, I, I think that there is something extremely, extremely beautiful about, about the willingness to, to bring art and music um, to death, right? That's kind of the idea of lamentation is that there is grief. That's, that's its main function is to process the grief, allow the grief to come out in a physical way, but it's also to make it moving and, and beautiful. Um, and I think that that's, that's kind of this idea of the swan singing, um, to signify this, this, moment of death and the the passage of death it brings that that tremendous grace and beauty to it i always think of because i'm such a lord of the rings idiot um (laughs) 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 the the, uh there's a scene (laughs) and um i think the second one they all just blend into one at this point because I always just watch them all the way through. Um, but I think it's in, in the, the two towers um, where some people have, have passed away and Eowyn um, goes out and she sings this, this lament um, and she has no other voices with her. It's just her and her voice is nice, but it's not that pretty. It's just kind of rough. And uh, it's, it's one of the most moving like things and, and, that series for me watching that I always, I always cry for no reason, even though I don't care (laughs) about, about the moment. It's like the song is what is, is so like it, it releases the grief, you know, that we have stored up. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's so special that this, the swan has that, has that element. I've never actually heard a swan. Right. So this is, this is one of those areas where I, you know, have come across this info and I'm wondering do swans actually make, do they sing? Like, what is this about? I needed to Google this. I needed to like look for a YouTube video of it and I didn't. Um, oh, but that's I was fine. really excited. I was like, what no, is know. it? So I don't know if it's like a mythical thing saying, oh, they only, they sing rarely. Um, and when you hear something that sounds like a swan singing, that's, you know, someone's That's so dying. interesting. I'm yeah. worried now that they just like honk or something terrible. I think they definitely do, but there must yeah. be some other kind of behavior. I mean, the thing about them that's so interesting is like if you, like we were talking about with that little reel that we were both advertised, they have these elaborate rituals um, of like yeah. mating and maintaining relationship with one another. And so they also have just this very mysterious kind of architecture, like psychological architecture that they seem to exist inside of. Um, so yeah, it's worth a Google, but it must, there must be something to it. If there are these stories about the swan, yeah. swan song being something, you know, it's important. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Well, now that's, that's a rabbit hole I'm going to get down. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I, I, again, like, I think that all of the, um, 
the kind of suggestion of something that is so pure and, you know, immediately making us think of its opposite. I keep coming back to this idea with the swan and that's not to negate its, its so-called purity. Um, but there is something here that's really interesting about, um, like the soul. I think that the swan Mm -hmm. is also really oriented to something that is like, um, kind of like divine. It is something Mm -hmm. that is magical in that the way that it comports itself and also being the bird of the poet is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned that, that is so interesting. It's in the symbols kind of right up here. And, you know, as someone who writes poetry, I think about the swan often. Um, and I think that deepening our understanding and like tugging on the edge of this particular symbol and saying, it's not just about what is pure and inviolable and even like it has this kind of virginal quality to it, right. Because of its, Mm. its, um, sort of femme orientation at first glance. Um, Mm -hmm. but there has to be something that's deeper and a little bit more visceral and primal, I think about, about the swan. So that's where the Zeus stuff comes in, uh, the Zeus idea. Mm -hmm. You just reminded me as you were talking of a poem, um, cause I'm like, there's gotta be some swan poetry out there that my brain has stored. Like Keats has definitely written a poem about swans. And I remember Rilke wrote a, po- a swan poem mm-hmm. actually. Um, and I, I just remembered it's, it speaks so beautifully to what we're talking about. So I'm going to read it actually, cause I pulled it up here and it's, it's short. So this is the swan by Rilke, Rainer Maria Rilke. This is, um, know who translated this one um but alas this laboring of ours with all that remains undone as if still bound to it is like the lumbering gate of the swan and then our dying releasing ourselves from the very ground on which we stood is like the way he hesitantly lowers himself into the water it gently receives him and gladly yielding flows back beneath him as wave follows wave while he now wholly serene and sure with regal composure, allows himself to glide. That's so pretty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, it's so, um, it's such a a nice image. Rilke did a, one of his little like passion projects was to write these poems to animals. He has one to the panther and other ones. I've read a lot of them in the past. Um, And there's this idea that he has in this poem of the releasing of ourselves and the allowing of ourselves to just glide, to just kind of embrace this, um, this majesty that we can have if we let go, we allow, allow ourselves to be somewhat undone. Um, and I think that that there's something about that in this one too. And another thread I want to pick up as well, you mentioned the word purity a few times. We we talked about this a little bit right before we jumped on. Um, but the swan is a bird that we see sometimes in alchemical imagery. Um, and it's connected to, as you, you know, you saw it, it's connected to the albedo. And in, in alchemy, there's a lot of different alchemical steps, different alchemists had different things that they wrote, but a lot of it kind of can be reduced down to these three main stages, which are albedo, nigredo, and rubedo, which means the whitening, the blackening, and the reddening. And this is also the basic formula for, um, for our individuation work, which is what Jung was so interested in. He added a, a fourth element to that, which is called the citrinitas, which comes before the rubedo, which I like adding that in, which basically means the yellowing. Um, but this, this movement is the, the purification of ourselves moving to the, the kind of disintegration of ourselves. And then finally the transformation of ourselves. And so the swan, um, being representative because of his pure white coloring of the albedo of the whitening, kind of reminds us of this experience of purification. And when we're talking about purification, we're not, we don't necessarily mean that we're, you know, cleansing ourselves of our sins more. So we're talking about the ability to, to kind of really look at ourselves with honesty, right. To really, to really see ourselves and kind of take away the shame of, of what we see to feel like we are in some way, 
we're distilling the essence of ourselves, basically. And I really think it's it's very pretty to bring in the swan into this as a symbol of that that development. As you said, it's the the um, the swan is attached to the albedo, and then with the uh, r- the Negredo, we have usually the crow or the raven, depending, because they're black. And then with the rubedo, it's always the phoenix, because mm-hmm. it's always the transformation, the rising up of the ashes. Um, and I just, it's just such a beautiful way of kind of placing it in a, in a you know, more intimate context with with how we experience ourselves and that idea of purification. And, and I don't know, bringing in Rilke's um, poem to this ability to, to kind of just glide and to allow ourselves to be somewhat undone and to enjoy the beauty that we have and also kind of, you know, this, the, the intensity, the, the grief, the dying that we're also going through at the same time. Mm-hmm. I love that so much. And I love the fact that the swan shows up as a bird in that alchemical process because, um, I don't know, I just have a thing about animals. <laughs> I really like mm-hmm. that there's like this continuum from Raven to Phoenix with Swan in the middle. And it feels really, really interesting because I think that when we have um, symbolism like that, we can more easily imagine ourselves embraced by that process, right? Like, what does it really mean to be in the the, the blackening or the negredo or the albedo? It's kind of abstract, um, but yeah. if we can find a symbol like a raven or a crow um, or a swan, we can say I am affirmed by this continual piece of the alchemical or individuation process that I feel like I'm in. And I wonder how often it's interesting, like crows and ravens, or at least crows are way more common than swans, Mm -hmm. at least Mm -hmm. in, in nature. Crows can be in any tree. And for a swan, i they require, they're like aquatic birds, right? So they require Mm -hmm. that water element. Um, And unless you live near a pond or a stream, then you don't see them very often. Um, So there's this rarity to that albedo part of the process that Mm -hmm. I feel. Um, Right. So I think that that's very curious. And um, yeah, that was also part of what Hilma uh, was interested in swans for. She was Mm -hmm. thinking about swans because she was interested, Hilma Afklint, I'm on a first mm-hmm. name basis, clearly. Um, yeah, obviously. She was interested in the swan as a symbol of, of alchemy um, because she was very interested mm-hmm. in those processes. So um, that's part of the reason why um, the swan is part of a few different series that she created around these alchemical concepts, which is really cool. Um, always in pursuit of the philosopher's stone, right? That's like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. aren't we all? Aren't we all? Okay. Yes, totally. <laughs> We're all here doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that the the swan is something. You know, when I was a kid, I didn't I didn't really like swans. I was very anti swan, and I think it was because I was supposed to like swans, being a girl, um, and a girl who liked pretty things. Hey, you were a girly girl. I was a girly girl. Yes, um, I. But you know, I hated Lisa Frank. To wow. Explain that. I wow. Know, I did not like. You know, I didn't like purple. But you love pink. I am obsessed with pink, but so what I'm, is your problem? I, I, it's a very specific shade of. Pink. <sighs> I do not care for hot pink or bubblegum pink. Mm-hmm. Those are horrible. What's your ideal pink? It's it's like a, a rose mauve pink. Okay, it's extremely specific. I I cannot. I'm shocked. <laughs> look at my Instagram. <laughs> I have an obsession with this color. Um, but I don't – I did not like purple at all at the time. And so Lisa Frank is like bubblegum pink and purple. Um, and I wasn't a fan. But anyway, there was – I feel like, you know, I – all of the the folders and notebooks and whatever that was on, it's always like a swan and a koala and that's mm-hmm. like it. And I, I not, she had a lot not, of dolphins and I like the dolphins. Do, I don't like dolphins either <laughs> or I didn't as a kid at least. Um I'm very anti-conformist and so anti-conformist that I'm anti-anti-conformist. I'm proud of you. Analyze me. Um, <laughs> no, I just didn't want to like things that other people liked. And so I was very like, ew, swans are gross. They're dumb. Who really likes them? Nobody. Um, and it's <laughs> it's interesting now that when I see one in nature, I'm like, oh, shit, <laughs> that's exquisite. 
Mm-hmm. Like that's, it takes my breath away almost to see one. Um, and it's so strange too, because they should be weird looking to us. Why are their necks so long? <laughs> why, why are they so big? They're scary that they're so big. You know, I, uh, for my honeymoon, my husband and I went to Paris, then we went to London and we were in, I want to say we were in St. James Park. Um, and the, the park is pretty, but like the main feature is the birds. They, they keep birds. Like it's a whole zoo mm-hmm. in this park. It's so cool. And we were just like following swans, just walk, like walking down the path. And there's a whole bunch of them in the, in the, you know, pond. And, and I was just like, I felt like I was in a dream world. It was really, it, they really have this way of transporting you and you feel like you're in a magical place. It's, it's so fascinating to me how they have that that capacity because as you said you'll see a crow and you'll be like ah no thanks or you'll see even a raven and be like that's unusual but it won't have the same effect as seeing a swan there's something about it that's like oh my god like I am in a romance right now and, yeah. and it is intense when I see crows I just feel like a witch I'm like hello my friends you we see a lot dawn. of them yeah <laughs> I don't know you see too we what did how many were on that tree we were when we were on the beach there was um, oh an extremely creepy tree, a uh, driftwood tree that someone had stuck in the sand, obviously to <laughs> do some kind of medieval torture um, to a witch probably. And uh, there were just crows sitting on top of it. And I was like, oh, dear. I think that there were four. I think that there were four. Am I wrong? I don't, I don't remember exactly. Yeah. We have to find, I have to source where this is. I think it's in the, uh, what's that Welsh book of? The Mabinogion. Thank you. Wow. That was very quick. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could, every time I try to pronounce it, I. I don't know if I'm, I'm saying it right at all. Through. I'm probably I don't butchering know. it. <laughs> um, but th- I think it's in that where they're like, they have the little nursery rhyme about what it means when you see a certain numbers of crows mm-hmm. and it's very specific and it's like if you see two crows it's you're dead and it's mm-hmm. like very intense I don't know if that's true but yeah Celtic um, mythology has so much bird stuff in it and yeah. I think that that's really fascinating um yeah. yeah I'm reading in the symbols book for the Celtic um myths swans are solar beneficent they possess the therapeutic powers of the sun and mm-hmm. Their music is magic. Swans with gold or silver chains around their neck hmm. are the supernatural appearance of the divine. So I don't know how swans are getting necklaces in the wild, <laughs> but maybe in ancient Wales <laughs> they are <laughs> wearing jewelry. Uh, but that's very um, beautiful. Mm-hmm. That is. I, I think that that's, that's something very special to see. I'll look for swans with, with jewelry. Um, but yeah. So I think that we've we've covered a lot of, of gorgeous things about the swan. There was more to the swan than I thought there would be. I was kind of like, where are we going to land? It's going to be like, they're pretty. Um, but no, there's so much to them. We'll there's... always find the death in the symbol and talk about that. So you don't have to worry. It's fine. Yeah. Well, that's why we're <laughs> friends. Because we like to talk about death. Mm-hmm. Um, but not really. Not really. Not really. <laughs> we actually just like to talk about cats. That's really what we like to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> mostly um but yeah the the swan is such a rich rich symbol and there's so many layers to it and there's this i love that we pulled out this sense of duality and the light and the dark and the beauty and the masculinity the solar kind of purity of it we, we pulled out so many threads so maybe now is a good time to head over to to a dream symbol let's do it If you're enjoying this podcast, we encourage you to leave a review or learn more about how you can support us on Patreon, where you can get access to some exciting exclusive offerings. Or you can connect with us by sharing a symbolic experience, whether from a dream or synchronicity, for us to explore on the show. Thank you to today's sharer, and please tell us your symbolic experience or connect with us on our website, soarmysticapodcast.com. Are you a small business looking to reach a targeted audience of people interested in all things esoteric? If this sounds like you, Sora Mystica would love to invite you to become an ad partner. We offer a highly tailored audience of mindful, curious, depth-seeking listeners, and we would be delighted to showcase your business and offerings to new hearts and new minds. 
simply fill out an advertiser application form at our website, linked in the show notes below, or navigate to sorormysticapodcast.com forward slash advertise with us. Moon Magic is a spiritual wellness center located in northern New Jersey, and owner Karen Foote is a spiritual intuitive healer whose passion is to empower her clients by connecting them to their authentic selves. She offers distance healing sessions, which incorporate Reiki healing combined with a chakra reading report, crystal healing, and oracle card reading. Her in-person sessions include all of that, plus hands-on Reiki, massage, and craniosacral therapy. I don't know about you, but this all sounds so delightful to me, so make sure you check out her offerings at moonmagicwellness.com. Looking to ground and enrich your manifestations and release any stagnant or negative energy that may be causing resistance? This could be a great opportunity to receive supportive Reiki and intuitive energy healing from Tangerine Sage Healing. Stephanie creates a serene capsule for Usui and Holy Fire Reiki, intuitive energy healing, and multi-dimensional intuitive guidance readings for those who are seeking relief and are ready to ground newfound inspiration and abundant manifestation into one's most authentic self and life. Use code Tangerine Sage at checkout to receive 25% off your first session when you book at tangerinesagehealing.com. And I am myself a loyal client of Tangerine Sage. So once you've booked your session, go over to our Instagram at Pod and let us know that you've done so and we'll send you a free archetypal tarot meditation kit as a gift to you. So go ahead and check out tangerinesagehealing.com. This dream symbol comes to us from a listener who writes, I had an archetypal dream of a witch who lived in a stone castle and was guarding a papyrus or a parchment containing a manuscript that she was penning with a quill. I asked her for her wisdom because I knew she was a witch and thought naturally she'd have something to share about the cosmos. She shouted at me, it's too late. As soon as she had said that, I woke up. It began as such a tranquil dream, but quickly turned ominous with her voice. I'm still trying to figure out what was too late and what kind of message this dream had. (laughs) So this is wonderful for so many reasons. And the first thing that jumps out to me here is just the pure um, like trickster energy that I feel the witch is holding at this moment. And I, so obviously the witch is a super profound symbol unto itself, um, mm-hmm. super important archetype, super important kind of person in our magical communities. But um, we invest a lot of power in symbols and people that are outside of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's something, this is just my first like crack at this, but my first impulse was to say, the witch is telling you that it's too late, but you don't know what's too late or why. Are we to believe this witch? And mm. I'm not here to doubt witches. However, I'm here to say maybe there's something in this dream that's asking you to root the awareness of the self back in the psyche in your own perspective rather mm. than letting somebody else kind of tell you what the wisdom of the cosmos is. Um, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally does. I I I think that makes a lot of sense, especially since it began as a tranquil dream. It's almost like you think you're actually going to get something out of it. And then you're like humbly approaching the the divine figure and they're like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it feels it feels very much like a, a trickster. I totally I totally think you're right. There's definitely it's kind of like a Macbeth witch, mm, yeah. right? Like the Macbeth witches are like. They're like, we're going to tell you something you don't want to hear, but we're going to do it in a riddle and you're not going to get it. And that's the point. <laughs> um, there, There is a trickster energy, certainly about the witch archetype sometimes, not all the time. Um, but I, I really like that. I mean, you, this my, my thinking is like, are you really going to go to a witch and have her reveal the secrets of the cosmos to you? Is she actually going to give it to you? No. Probably not. No. She's also, um, witches are known to be you know, in, in our mythologies, they're evil. Generally, they represent some kind of darkness and there's a, like a, a real selfishness to them too. Mm -hmm. They're really out for themselves. So I would be very dubious if I saw a witch in my dream that I would get anything from her. I think that that's interesting. Um, 
I think that the selfishness comes from the fact that witches are often outsiders and they're forced to fend for themselves. And so to go to a witch and say, please help me figure out this mystery, she's already put in the energy to figure it out for herself. So she wants you to do the same thing. And so she's trying Mm. to scare you off and say, it's too late because someone probably said that to her once. And so I think for our listener, um, you know, I don't know if anything in particular was too late, but it might be a good opportunity to check in with who are you giving, who are you giving um, authority to in your Mm -hmm. psyche? Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's also interesting that she's like writing a manuscript or she's guarding like a papyrus. And that's to me, like the quill and the pen is a symbol of Mercury, who is also Mm -hmm. a face Mm -hmm. of the trickster archetype. And so I feel like this was like a daimonic trickster in disguise as a witch in your dream and absolutely yes it's like approaching the oracle um but it's actually not an oracle it's a it's a fake out so i i wouldn't worry about this yielding a lack of answers uh, or give you anxiety i think it's about rooting something back into the self yeah i mean for sure i don't think it's too late i mean i mean Maybe there is something too late. Who knows? That it's always possible that the dreams do point to some kind of knowledge that we already hold. Maybe there's something you're looking for or something you want to learn that you've already learned and it's too late to go back and try to learn it again. That that's entirely possible. But there's a there's this theme in here, as you said, of like the parchment. It feels very old, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there she lives in a stone castle. So we're automatically looking to the past. We're looking to the ancient. Um, and we're we have these elements of like wisdom um, that's been passed down and there's something to be protected in this. And, you know, the dreaming ego wants this wisdom, wants to receive it. Um, and the witch says it's too late. And of course it's never, that's, we just know that for a fact, this is a fact. It's never too late to learn divine wisdom of the cosmos. <laughs> in fact, it's probably always too early. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't, I don't think that that's a true thing. So don't worry about that, that it's actually too late to learn the secret that the witch has. But I do, I am curious with you of what, why she says it's too late. Why doesn't she say, it, you know, you don't get to have it. You're not mm-hmm. good enough. Or, you know, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Or the door is shut in your face. Or, or some other way of blocking you out from this wisdom. Why is it too late? And that idea is something that I would highly recommend that you ponder. Not, not so much, you know, whether you're too late to actually receive this wisdom. But what is that that phrase just taking the phrase itself what does too late make you think of um you know one of the things that Jungians like to do sometimes is they'll they'll kind of break down the image in a lot of funky ways you know so they'll they might even say something like okay too and late let's look at them as words look at the etymologies even they can do wild things sometimes it's very fun um but this idea of too late why are you too late what does that make you feel like? Is there a pressure maybe in your life that you feel like you have to, you really have to master this thing or that time is running out for you in some way? Um, that might be a question that I would offer for you to, to ponder. Um, also that, you know, again, you're asking for wisdom from a witch. And I, I'm assuming, this is an assumption, but I'm assuming because you saw the witch and your dream ego was not afraid, but there's probably part of you in waking life that is kind of interested in witches or appreciates the mythology of witches or the archetype of the witch. But I would also be curious, you know, the witch as an archetypal figure, even though we know that she is an expression of the repressed feminine, repressed feminine autonomy and authority, there is something scary about it still. Where's the fear? Where's Mm -hmm. the the hesitation to, you Mm -hmm. know, about asking for something so big? Yeah. That's interesting to me too. I love that. Yeah. When I think of the phrase, because now I'm thinking about answering your question as we're sitting here. And when I think of the phrase, it's too late, I think of Saturn, the planet. Mm, Oh, yeah. Right. And I think that um, the feeling of running out of time is a kind of Saturn trick that happens to us. So dear, dear listener, reader, writer, I would be curious um, where you are at in your own Saturn cycle? Are you near a Saturn return? Are you near a Saturn square opposition? Mm, What's going on for you there? Yeah. Astrologically, that might be an interesting thing to tune in with. And I can say that during my Saturn return, that was my like 
really bad negative mantra. Like it's too late. I've totally screwed up. I don't have any time left. I'm out of time to complete my thesis, to find my path, blah, 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 whatever I was trying to do. (laughs) Have a mental breakdown in slow motion. (laughs) Too late to have a mental breakdown. Too late to do anything except call (laughs) Marianne on the phone and cry. And so, but it's not true, right? So that's the thing Mm -hmm. as well. And that's the other, I think, beautiful message that comes from tools like tarot and astrology is that it's really honestly usually not too late for whatever it is we're trying to discover or find. Maybe we have missed one angle of an opportunity, but we are always in process with these questions. And so um, I think that figuring out how to dispel the anxiety of things really being too late is uh, also part of something that the dream is offering you the opportunity to do. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Said so beautifully. I I really like this dream. I think it's something to continue to sit with. You described it as an archetypal dream, so it obviously felt like it had some power for you. Um, and maybe active imagination would be interesting. She would probably just tell you it's too late again and shut the door in your face. It, it could be. Um, but I, I think that exploring the witch, less is the witch and more is the trickster. I mm-hmm. think that you're right, Christina, that there's something about – this trickster, trickster energy dressing up as in a way that you might have some reverence for, but it's actually the trickster kind of in disguise. Not totally in disguise because the witch can also be a trickster too in some ways, but there's just something about it that feels like – because the point of the trickster, and we will have an entire episode on this yeah, when clearly we, we need to. <laughs> feel like we can not – it won't ruin our lives. Um, <laughs> the, the, whole, the whole thing with the trickster is that – it tricks you in order to shift the perspective dramatically in a way that you really didn't anticipate. So it's supposed to mess you up a little bit. It's kind yeah. of the point. So I would, you know, there's this, this old feeling of like, there is ancient wisdom here in the castle on the parchment, you know, and it's like, no, you don't get it. It doesn't matter. Go away. Um, I don't know. I'm delighted. I want to meet the switch. She sounds cool. Yeah. That's a great dream. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Okay, lovely. So um, thanks, everybody, for listening to our Swans episode and, uh, you know, letting us explore it (laughs) beside you. Um, As always, if you have a moment, we'd love for you to leave us a review somewhere wherever you get your podcasts. We are – we're growing a little bit. It's really cool. It's very exciting. So we would appreciate your input and we hope you, you know, follow us on Instagram and, and do the things. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you for joining us in our conversation today. Please consider supporting the podcast by leaving a review and following Soar or Mystica wherever you listen. You can also become a more active supporter and a member of the Soar or Mystica community by joining our Patreon. If you have a symbolic experience that you'd like to share with us for the podcast, you can tell us all about it at soarmysticapodcast.com. The music for this podcast is written and performed by me, Mariana Lewis, with special thanks to Stefan Lewis. You can connect with both Christina and myself on Instagram and get to know our work by clicking on the links in the show notes. As the alchemical motto goes, as above, so below, as within, so without. May this ancient wisdom continue to guide you deeper. Until next time, take good care.